So, um, so again, when you think about these these abiotic factors we're talking about, think about, well, how would that affect animals that might have to live in that place? Okay. All right, so the movement of warming and cooling air masses around the Earth is strongly affected by the rotation of the Earth, right? So if I bring back my daughter's little globe, you know, the rotation of the Earth is obviously going to have an impact on that. Um, so um, adiabatic processes, and we're going to talk about what those are, but that's about parcels of air moving. And those adiabatic processes associated with, the, with rising and shrinking air masses, and then you combine that with the Coriolis force that's spinning. This is, gonna, this is what causes the major planetary patterns of wind and precipitation. So an adiabatic process, this is um, in a, a process in which heat is neither lost nor gained from the outside, so it stays the same. But a parcel of air, it compresses and warms, or it expands and cools. But there's no interchange, you know, no exchange of energy, right, heat energy, with the surroundings, okay? So the heat is neither lost nor gained. But we do have this compression and warming or expanding and cooling. So temperature change in rising and descending air masses is an adiabatic process, right? So temperature change with rising air masses, that's considered an adiabatic process. Um, so um, sometimes you might hear the term an adiabatic lapse rate, and that's the change in temperature in a mass of air as it moves upward. So thinking about that, so as a, a warm, water-laden air mass from the equator, right, that warm middle part of the Earth, you have warm air, it's going to be water-laden air. When it rises and cools by this adiabatic process, it's going to become saturated with water at its dew point, and then the water vapors are going to condense and, and precipitate, right? They're going to rain. So you're going to have heavy rainfall typically near the equator, and that's why it happens through this adiabatic process. This warm, water-laden equatorial air mass rises and cools with this adiabatic process. So again, then the water... Uh, condenses, it's, first it becomes saturated, and then it condenses, and then rain falls, okay? Now, Coriolis force, right, this is the result of the Earth's rotation. Um, so this is the idea that um, a moving object veers to the right in the northern hemisphere and veers to the um, uh, left in the southern hemisphere relative to the surface of the Earth. And this rotation, this effect is maximal at the poles and minimal at the equator. So when you think about winds, then, that are associated with that Coriolis force, these are, those winds are the things that are driving the major oceanic currents. And those, of course, all those things together are going to determine climate, right? So in the northern hemisphere, the ocean waters rotate clockwise. And in the southern hemisphere, the ocean waters rotate counterclockwise, okay? So thinking about that. So again, winds um, associated with the moving atmosphere in that Coriolis force they're the driving forces behind the oceanic currents. So again, in the north hemisphere, the ocean waters rotate clockwise. And in the southern hemisphere, the ocean waters rotate counterclockwise. Okay. So ocean currents then, in turn, are going to significantly alter global climate because they transport heat, right? You think about ocean currents moving about and bringing that heat from the equator, for example, and distributing it towards the poles, right? So you have this, um, this impact um, with transport of heat from equatorial to Arctic regions. Okay, and then a classic example of this are, is the, the southern oscillation. So the La Nina feast and El Nino famine events. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about those. So on the right-hand side of the figure here, we have the La Nina uh, part of that southern oscillation. And on the left, we have the El Nino um, part of that southern oscillation. And so these represent sort of opposite extremes. I have a... Sorry, I have some chats coming up. I'm just going to check it. Oh, <laughs> not just ocean water, water going in the drains too. It says misconception, but then Shan says she saw it in person. Well, that's kind of interesting. Um, there are some videos about um, about that actually that I have seen that are pretty entertaining. Okay, and that's about rotation of you know the example I think that you see is, sometimes is when you flush a toilet in the northern hemisphere versus the southern hemisphere. Okay. So these opposite extremes, so when you're looking at these figures, so when you have white and red, that's warm water, and when you have this purple and blue, that's cold water. Okay, and here's North America, Central America, and then uh, South America there. So this, we're looking in the Pacific. Oops. Somebody's microphone is not muted. There we go. Okay. Um, so this Southern Oscillation, it's a, this anomalous large-scale ocean atmosphere system 
that's associated with strong fluctuations in ocean currents and surface temperatures. So it causes these sort of abnormal atmospheric and environmental conditions, um, primarily in the equatorial regions, as you see from the color mapping here, um, in the Pacific Basin. So this, these um, southern oscillation events are a major example, then, of the connectedness between ocean currents and atmospheric conditions. Okay? So this, um, there's these two components that we'll mention. So first, the El Nino component. Right. This is um, and where this comes from. So early sailors that were fishing off the coast of South America noticed this phenomenon that during certain times of the year, the coastal waters off of South America got um, really, really warm, like abnormally warm, and it meant that fishing was really bad at that time. And this usually occurred around Christmas time. Um, and so the occurrence became known as the El Nino, meaning the little boy or the Christ child. Um, that's how the, the name came to be. So today, today the term is often used um, in reference to this unusually warm water conditions off um, the equatorial region of the Pacific, in the Pacific Ocean. And then La Nina is Spanish for the little girl, and it refers to the abnormal cold ocean surface temperatures in the equatorial Pacific when actually fishing is better. Somebody's microphone is still on. Okay. All right. Um, so then um, heat energy is not, it's obvious now from that discussion, I think that heat energy is not distributed equally over the planet, right? There's variation in, in heat budgets that account for global temperature and wind and um, rain patterns and ocean currents, right? So there's going to be this variation. So global climate or macro climate, macro means big, right? So the global climate or the macro climate is determined by this combination of sea surface temperature, ocean currents, and the atmosphere. And so climate, you can think of it as the product of weather over time. And so solar radiation, importantly, is a major determinant of that uh, climate. OK, so we'll narrow in a little more now and talk about regional climate. So climate and seasonal changes of a particular region are not only a function of the global patterns that we've talked about, but they're also influenced by many other factors, um, like the position in a continental landmass. So if you're locked in the interior versus on a coastal area, you're, the regional climate is going to be very different, right? Locked in the center, it, you tend to have much more variation in extremes, really cold winters, really hot summers. Whereas on the coasts, like you think about Vancouver, it's it's fairly moderate, right? Like Vancouver gets daffodils flowering in February, for example. Um, so it's a much more moderate climate. There's less variation, and that's because of the impacts of the ocean that are there. Okay, so again, the position in a continental landmass is going to have an impact on the regional climate. Again, coastal regions are more moderate than inland regions, and there's also the impacts of topography the absence or presence of those nearby water bodies to the Great Lakes or the oceans are going to have an impact as well. And so then what that means is that regional climate is going to be impacted by landscape features. So for example, the topography in mountainous regions can have really pronounced effects and may result in things like rain shadow effects. We're going to talk about these in a little more detail. So rain shadow effects, and then there's impacts in uh, north versus south facing slopes, um, inversion patterns that happen, and then, you know, valley fog in these mountainous areas, and then upslope and downslope winds, they're also going to have an impact. So also, uh, regional climate changes with altitude in mountainous areas too, right? So there's the surface variation, but there's also the vertical variation. So it's colder at the top, you know, of a mountain than it is at the bottom. And so you have a drop of one degree Celsius in temperature for every 100 meter rise in elevation, generally speaking, right? So it gets colder as you go up. Um, and then again, large bodies of water, like the oceans, can act as heat sinks, and so that's going to moderate the regional climate in, in coastal areas. The example, again, being like um, for Vancouver, where they don't have very extreme summers or very extreme winters compared to, so you know, the, the Midwest of the U.S. Okay, so the first one of those regional things I want to talk about are uh, rain shadow effects in mountainous areas. So the, and you've probably learned about this before in, in geography classes, even maybe in, in high school and such. So formation of a rain shadow, what happens here, so this rain shadow effect, um, air is forced up and over the mountain, and as it rises, the air mass cools, right? We talked about that adiabatic process. So as the air mass rises, it cools, 
then its moisture condenses and then precipitates out as rain on the windward side of the mountain. So it's moist and lush on this side of the mountain. Um, but then the descending air mass um, is dry, and so it picks up moisture from the leeward side, causing this rain shadow effect where you end up having this hotter, drier condition on that other side of the mountain. Okay, so think about again, you know, what what would this, how would this affect the distribution and the abundance of animals that live in these mountainous areas? What kind of animals, you know, would you find on this side of the mountain versus the kind of animals you might find on this side of the mountain, and the types of thermal and moisture tolerances those animals might have. So I'm not just wanting to think about that um, as we move through it. What kind of adaptations would the animals need to have to survive on, on either side of this mountain? Another aspect to consider is north versus south facing slopes. So in the, and we're, this is, I'm going to refer to northern hemisphere here. So in the northern hemisphere, the south facing slope, so this southern exposure, which is indicated here, southern exposure, the orange line, um, south facing slopes receive the most solar radiation, so they're warm and dry, versus north facing slopes, which is indicated here by the blue line. Um, the north facing receive the least, and so they're cooler and moister. And so this has large impacts on the moisture and heat budgets of animals that might be choosing to be on north or do certain activities on north and south facing slopes. So if you look at a specific example, if we focus in on about, you know, five o'clock here, on the south facing slope, it's like 20 degrees, unfortunately it's Fahrenheit, it should be Celsius, but anyway, uh, science should be in Celsius. On the, on the uh, south facing slope, it's about 20 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than it is on a north facing slope at the same time of day. So you can think about what impact that might have for animals living in these areas. So in the northern hemisphere, an example is um, turtles generally prefer to nest on south-facing slopes than on north-facing slopes because the incubation conditions are going to be better. They're going to be warmer on those south-facing slopes. And this you know, has, a, has management implications and conservation implications because when we're building artificial nest sites for turtles, we try to make sure they have a very nice south-facing slope because that's what female turtles prefer to choose. And it enhances incubation conditions for those eggs. Another thing to consider under regional climates are these inversion patterns. What happens with temperature gradients in the daytime versus the nighttime? So um, in, the, in the daytime, solar energy hits the Earth's surface and air above that surface during the day, right? And so you end up in the daytime, you have this direct solar radiation, you also have diffuse sky radiation. And so it's coming in from the sun, and you're going to have a warm surface here, and, it's, and the temperature gradient basically is going to be cooler as you go up into the atmosphere. But in the nighttime, it's called an inversion pattern because the opposite thing happens. Now the sun's not shining, and so now you end up with this inversion where it's actually cooler at the surface, and it gets warmer as you move up through the atmosphere. And then in the, the sun shines, and that changes again. So thinking about how that might impact an animal's dial activity cycle, so it's daytime activity cycle, um, or if it's a nocturnal animal versus a diurnal animal. You're thinking about how these temperature inversions might have an impact, right, during solar radiation. So thinking about what an ectotherm or an endotherm might do under these um, conditions. Another interesting aspect to consider for regional climates are these things called urban heat islands, right? So urban settings act as heat islands in which the temperature can be many degrees, six to eight degrees Celsius warmer than the surrounding countryside, even more. Um, and this has to do with all those buildings and pavement that are there, right? So buildings and pavement absorb and re-radiate heat in contrast to natural vegetation and water. You know, natural vegetation has a low heat conductivity and rainwater now in these, these urban islands um, with all those surfaces, you know, concrete and asphalt and everything, the rainwater quickly drains away so that reduces evaporation, so there's very little evaporative cooling, so just, you know, hotter and hotter. Um, and the air temperature also is going to rise because you have a bunch of humans and their metabolic heat that they produce. You've got waste heat from the buildings that are there, and the vehicles, and, and then that heat's going to get trapped. Um, and so basically you have buildings and roads replacing open land and vegetation and replacing water bodies. So the surfaces that were permeable and moist become impermeable and dry when you create a cityscape. And so this causes urban regions to become warmer than the surrounding rural and natural areas. And so the example that's given here, this is uh, Chapel Hill, 
a city in North Carolina, um, and the corporate limits are are uh, indicated by the yellow shading here, and then this is the, the highest population density, the sort of deepest downtown. And these are thermal uh, isoclines, thermoplets, you could call them, but they're, you know, they're sort of like topographic map uh, lines, contour lines, but based on temperature gradient. And so right in that downtown core, it's, on this given example, it's 21 degrees Celsius, and then as you move out, it's 19 degrees Celsius, and then as you move out to more of the countryside, you can see that it goes down to about 17 degrees Celsius. So there's this thermal gradient from the city core to the uh, more uh, rural areas. And then we can look at this graphically. So the, the heat islands occur sort of at two scales. They occur at both the surface and then also in the atmosphere. So this is related to that temperature inversion stuff we just talked about as well with day and night. So um, in this graphic, we have um, a, a gradient of sort of rural um, to suburban to you know urban area downtown with skyscrapers and then moving back out to rural. And then we have um, surface temperatures indicated by solid lines, and then we have air or atmospheric temperatures indicated by dashed lines. And then the orange is telling you daytime temperatures and the blue is telling you nighttime temperatures. So on a hot, sunny summer day, the sun can heat the dry, exposed urban surfaces like roofs and pavement to temperatures that are like 27 to 50 degrees Celsius hotter than the air. So that's like crazy hot, right? So those surfaces, I know if you one time I went, many, many years ago, I went to Las Vegas, actually, in the summer, and I remember crossing the street and my feet burning through the soles of my shoes because it was so hot on those surfaces. So, again, on a hot, sunny summer day, the sun can heat the dry, exposed urban surfaces, like roofs and pavement, to temperatures, again, that are 27 to 50 degrees Celsius hotter than the air. While the shaded sort of or moist surfaces often, you know, the more these more rural surroundings, they remain closer to the air temperatures. So the air and the surface temperatures are less um, variable um, from each other, right? So there's um, there's in the on the surfaces there's a large difference between the surface and the air temperatures. But then when you get to those more natural, a little bit more natural areas, there's less of a difference between those surface and air temperatures. Okay, but surface temperatures heat up by so much. Um, in contrast, though, so then when you think about those, um, well, not sort of in contrast, but the atmospheric temperatures um, around even uh, urban heat islands are often a bit weaker, right, than, than these surface temperatures. Um, but they do become more pronounced after sunset because there's a slow release of heat from all that urban infrastructure as well. So the annual mean temperature of a city with about a million people or more can be one to three degrees Celsius warmer than its surroundings. So that's the air temperature. Okay, so surface temperature is crazy warmer. Air temperature is also warmer um, when you have large populations. Um, and then if you have a clear, calm night, the temperature difference can be even greater than those couple of degrees. It could be up to like 12 degrees Celsius. So you have a smaller difference between the dotted lines is what that means, right? So the the air temperatures or the atmospheric temperatures, the dotted lines, are not as different as those surface temperature lines, the solid lines. So again, in this, this figure, we have uh, urban temperatures are typically lower at the urban-rural border, right? So the temperatures are lower sort of here at the edges. Um, and then when you look at, like, what happens where there's a park or a pond, look at how close together those temperatures come. That surface temperature just plummets and gets so much closer to the... Um, the surface temperature of both day and night. So that's telling you about that, about water um, um, giving that buffering capacity, right? So that um, the, the surface temperatures over the pond show how water can maintain this fairly constant um, temperature day and night, and this is because of the high heat capacity of water. And we're going to talk a little bit later about some of the special properties of water. So, and then similarly at the park, like where you have green space, you can see that the surface temperature drops down um, compared to, um, again, over these, this infrastructure, these warehouses where the surface temperature is so hot. So it tells you the value of having um, parks and, and wetland features within your cities to provide that thermal buffering. All right, I see some chat um, messages popping up here, so I'm going to just have a look at those. Um, Let's see, so bigger the city and concentration of buildings, the greater the heat levels generally. Do small towns encounter similar effects on a smaller scale? So that's a question from Noah. So um, 
Yes, so the bigger the city, the more um, obvious it's going to be. Again, you're going to have impacts, though, if there's green spaces and parks and, and wetland areas, you know, ponds and things within the city. Um, smaller towns would encounter similar effects on a smaller scale. I would say, yes, that's what's happening. So basically, the more pavement and buildings, the more difference still happens in small towns, but right, not as noticeable. So thank you, Cheyenne, for helping to answer that. Okay. All right. So that's regional climates. So now we're going to move to talk a little bit about microclimates. So these are the um, the important habitats that, that are for plants and animals, these little spaces. So the little climate in which the organism lives. So um, these differ overall from the prevailing climate because of differences, again, in topography, height above ground, plant cover, um, soil properties, other things, right? So this um, graphic is showing you um, temperature variation in a cornfield and how it changes with height as the corn changes in height, basically. And so the horizontal axis here is uh, the scale is showing you a change in one degree Celsius. And so as you look at how that that gradient of temperature changes with plant height. When the plant is really tiny, right, you have this warmer condition at the soil surface, but then there's this cooling effect with the plant height, um, and then it, it stays cooler as you go up in the atmosphere. But when you look at when the plant is taller, it's kind of interesting because it's the opposite. It's a bit cooler under, under the plant at the soil, and then it warms up, and then it's sort of hotter as you go up through the plant and stays warmer. So think about that in the context of maybe a beetle that's living in this cornfield and where it might in a beetle is an ectotherm where it might choose to be on, on a um, you know given parts of the day in terms of what temperatures it's seeking right so it can it can sit here on the ground surface and be really cool if it's trying to be but if it wants to warm up it can go up here on this plant leaf and, and bask and thermoregulate there so this is it this is called a change in the active surface as the plant height changes right so again thinking about how that might impact animals that are vertically distributed and horizontally distributed in that cornfield. So animals are going to exploit their available range of microclimates and seek the most favorable places. So another example could be a tropical uh, log dwelling salamander that moves to the sunlit side of a log during the cooler times of the day so it can warm up and then maybe go to the humid um, cooler portion of the log during the hottest part of the day so it can actually cool off. Um, as humans we tend to overlook these microclimate um, issues, we tend to not really look at their importance because we're basically masters of, of uh, controlling our own optimal microclimates, right, with our thermostats, our air conditioning, and our heaters and stuff. So very, very little aspect for us of dealing with these microclimates. We control ours pretty steadily. Okay. So I posted um, a couple of, I posted two papers, one scientific paper and one sort of more popular article on the D2L notes. And I wanted to talk a little bit about this one, this effective climate on frog populations, because um, I think this paper is really, really cool for many reasons. Um, one, because it covers a lot of the topics that we've talked about already. So things we talked about in lecture one, things we're talking about in today's lecture. Um, and it also touches on ideas that we're going to talk about later in the semester. So it talks about physiological ecology a little bit. It talks about life histories a little bit. So I wanted to just take a bit of time to actually uh, talk about what's happening in this in this paper that's published in the Journal of uh, Herpetology. So it's an older paper, but it, um, I chose it because it covers, like, as I said, lots of the things that we've been talking about. And it, in my mind, it makes um, makes it easier to understand stuff if you put it in the context of something real rather than just talking about it in sort of this abstract way. So this is a study about koki frogs in um, Puerto Rico. This is a terrestrial frog that lays terrestrial eggs. It has a very fast life history, um, meaning that it has, um, you know, it reproduces and grows, it, sorry, it grows up, becomes mature pretty quickly, reproduces, and then doesn't live much past that. So that's a very short lifespan and um, fast reproductive uh, cycle. So, um, so Dr. Stewart studied uh, population populations of these koki frogs in Puerto Rico over a 15-year period. So this is a really neat study because it's such a long data set. Um, so results of 15 years of population censuses. So last time, last lecture, we talked about, um, you know, estimating abundance and we talked about, um, you know, sample sizes and, and statistics and things like that. So as you, as you look at this paper, I'd like you to think about those things from the first lecture and we think about the sample sizes that were used and the survey methodology that was used. Okay, but 15 years of data right off 
So we can say that's a good long study for an animal that has a fast life history that would enable the researcher to get a good picture of what's happening. And so she followed this population of kogi frogs and other co-occurring frogs in a two by 50 meter plot. And so she surveyed, it's an active sur a, a survey transect that she um, surveyed um, continuously and looked at how the density, the population density of the frogs changed seasonally and annually. And again, it's in Puerto Rico. Um, and again, this is a direct de developing frog. So when they did their surveys, basically they looked for egg masses on all the, on the surfaces um, within the uh, study site, within that transect. So they would scan the ground and the, and the canopy systematically looking for um, uh, eggs, uh, frogs and eggs on there. Um, and they determined how population density uh, changes from year to year. So she recorded temperature and relative humidity, right? These things that we're talking about today, these regional climate and microclimate aspects. Um, and then she recorded light levels. We're gonna talk about that a little bit light later this lecture, um, consistently, you know, at the same time every day. Um, and, and then um, just in terms of some of the results. So she found that abi abiotic factors, the things we're talking about today, had effect on frog activity. So different activities of frogs. So for example, you know, frogs call for their communication and their mating. So no frogs were calling when temperatures fell below 18 degrees Celsius. So there's a, there's a temperature impact on that, that certain mating behavior. The activity itself declined after long periods without rain. So on a more longer time scale, when there was dry periods, they would stop calling. And what they did actually was adopt these water conserving postures during the dry period. So you know, they want to lose all the moisture across their skin surfaces. So they would sort of hunker down and close up their legs close to their bodies and have these water conserving postures. So clearly there's impacts there on those abiotic factors on the activity of the frogs. She also found that frog population density, that's a measure of abundance, right? We defined that last week, last time. And she found that the population density was negatively correlated with these long dry periods. And there's the statistics that we talked about last time to explain that. So the R value is 0 0.7. That means that 70% of the variation was explained by that relationship between frog population density and long dry periods. And it's a significant relationship, right? There's a less than 1% probability that the, this was a random pattern, meaning the interpretation is it must be a real pattern. Okay, so that's a um, good example of what we were looking at last week. Um, and on the longer scale, she also found that annual changes in population density were influenced by the rainfall patterns driven by the southern oscillation events that we just talked about, by El Nino and La Nina events were driving that population density variation. And another aspect of the biotic factors, she found that the number of predators varied um, in relation to weather events like Hurricane Hugo, which is described. The predators that were mostly focused on in this study were um, spiders that feed on the frogs. And so it's, it's you know, this, this is such a neat study in terms of covering so much of ecology, of animal ecology, from all these abiotic factors to an animal activity patterns, to abundance patterns, the statistics, the large weather events, and then also um, predators and their impacts. So again, it's a, I think it's a really great study that ties together uh, so much of uh, what we've been talking about so far. So I encourage you to have a look at it and, um, and, and think about that stuff. Okay, so then we're going to move on now and talk a little bit more about some other aspects of the physical environment, um, like light and those types of things. So first talking about light. So light is a part of, the, of the, uh, solar radiation that in the visible range of the wavelength. So like 400 to 740 nanometer wavelength. So that's the photosynthetically active radiation, right? That's the important stuff for plants for photosynthesis. So it's vitally important, obviously, to the ecosystems. Um, and so that's its spectral quality, right? That, that wavelength, the photosynthetically um, active wavelengths are particularly important for this discussion. So that spectral quality is one thing, but there's three other characteristics of light. There's the intensity, the duration, and the directionality. So intensity, this varies daily, seasonally, and with latitude. Um, and it's influenced by, again, the angle at which um, the light is striking the surface. So it's going to depend on the altitude of the sun um, and this sort of what we talked about already at the uh, start of the lecture. And then duration. So this is the seasonal, is seasonal and it's a function of latitude. I um, mean, this has to do with, you know, the shortest daylight of the year at the winter solstice and the longest daylight at the summer solstice, at least in the northern hemisphere, right? Um, and so I 
lately I've been really noticing how we are losing our daylight as we approach um, deeper into the fall. The daylight is getting so much shorter compared to what it was in the summer. Um, and then there's also directionality, which is the which shifts daily and seasonally as well. Um, and you know the sun is nearly overhead in the summer, but it drops towards the horizons in winter, right? So that directionality. So they're all interrelated to each other. So, and noting that when light hits an object, it can either be absorbed, reflected, or transmitted through it. So this is sort of the fate of light. And again, this is um, something I'll talk about a little bit more in winter ecology next semester, just very briefly touching on it um, here. Okay, so then there's the thermal environment. So the, a description of the uh, nature of temperature and heat exchange processes is really important to understanding a lot of the morphological and behavioral adaptations of animals, right? Just, um, you know, um, temperature, the temperature effect on the koki frog calling, right? So that behavioral um, uh, change uh, because it was too cold to call. Um, okay, so all organisms live in a thermal environment that's characterized by both heat and temperature. And so heat is molecular movement. This is a form of energy. It's a form of energy possessed by all substances, and it results from the, the random motion of molecules within that substance. And so the quantity of heat possessed by a substance is going to depend on the kinetic energy of those molecules that are in it, right? And so the ultimate source of heat is solar radiation. Okay, so it's heat is a is a form of energy. Temperature is basically the way we measure that energy. So temperature is the immediate direct measure of that average kinetic energy that's possessed by those molecules in a substance. So it's measuring a substance's tendency to give up heat, measuring a substance's tendency to um, of that energy. Okay. And all organisms require certain optimal temperature ranges to carry about, carry out their metabolic processes. And we'll talk about this in later lectures too. So um, an example, you know, would be like enzyme activities, right? Enzymes work slowly at cool temperatures and work quick, more quickly at warmer temperatures. But of course, then there's a thermal limit to their um, activity that can denature as well. So that's just an example of how a metabolic process is related to uh, temperature. Okay. And so all organisms have to maintain a balance between the energy that's in and the energy that goes out. They have to have a heat budget, right? So the gains must balance the losses. Um, so heat energy gained and heat energy lost have to be in balance. And so the picture here shows you the energy, uh, the exchange of energy between a frog and its environment. And so again, a heat budget means that the thermal energy absorbed from the environment plus metabolic heat produced it's going to have to equal the thermal energy that's lost from the body and also stored. So, so we look at, you know, what are the sources of heat gains? Where can the heat come from? Well, the heat gain is the total heat inputs from the sun, right? We have direct sunlight, scattered sunlight. Um, we also have reflected sunlight that's bouncing off of things, right? So we have reflect, reflected sunlight that's also coming in. Um, and then there's also sunlight that bounces off things in the environment, right? in this case, bouncing off some vegetation coming from the ground, too. And then there's heat loss. And so in terms of how heat is lost, we can have radiative heat loss, right? So the radiative heat loss from this frog here, for example. But we also have these three other uh, processes, conduction, convection, and evaporation. So conduction, this is the direct transfer of heat between um, uh, bodies that are touching each other, so bodies that are in contact. So for example, the frog sitting directly on the lily pad or um, a lizard sitting on a rock, there's going to be heat conduction between the lizard and that rock. And then convection, this is heat transfer through circulation of a fluid. So it could be water, which we think of pretty obviously as a fluid, but also air. Air is considered a fluid around that organism, right? So you can also have um, convection that way. And then there's also evaporative cooling, right? So the um, cooling um, due to evaporation. Okay, and then to talk a little bit about water, check my time. Um, so water is uh, essential, of course, to life on Earth, right? The requirement for water, it really profoundly affects the distribution, the physiology, the anatomy of plants and animals, and also the, the overall structure of aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems. I mean, it, it's hard to really define how important water is because it's just so important. And water is pretty bizarre in terms of, of its characters. So the structure and chemical features of water are directly related to the many effects of water on the environment and organisms. So, you know, it's got 
this weird polarity. It's got hydrogen bonding. It's got this lattice structure. It's got high viscosity, surface tension. It has different specific heat sort of properties, adhesion and cohesion among the molecules. Um, and then there's also this weird relationship um, compared to other substances between water temperature and its density. And again, this is something I talk about in more detail in winter ecology, which kind of builds from this course. But just thinking about this, right? When water freezes, it doesn't get denser. It actually gets less dense. And so ice floats. And this is something that always sort of strikes me as pretty amazing. When you think about what would life look like on Earth if ice didn't float? What if ice sank and you didn't have that ice surface over a liquid water situation for all the animals that live there? What would happen to fish? Would there even be fish? Um, what would happen to hibernating frogs and turtles and other things that stand on the bottom of those wetlands with their ice cap on the top? So it's just a, it's, it's really sort of mind-boggling if you try to think about how life could have evolved if water didn't have that weird property of having a lighter, a lesser density when it's a solid. So, um, so water can store tremendous amounts of heat with a small increase in temperature because of its, those hydrogen bonds that it has. So water has a really high specific heat. So this is the, the number of calories required to raise one gram of substance by one degree Celsius. So um, again, specific heat, it has a high specific heat. So the number of calories or energy, it takes a lot of energy to raise one gram of substance by one degree Celsius. So what this means is it takes a lot of heat, a lot of energy to melt ice. And so that's why, you know, in the spring here in Sudbury, we're wearing, you know, just t-shirts maybe and it's pretty warm out, but there's still ice on Ramsey Lake because it takes a lot of heat to melt that ice. So the water temperature changes slowly and it provides a thermal buffer, which is also a good reason why it's a place to hibernate, for example, if you're an animal that can't handle freezing temperatures. Um, and so there's also the aspect of the polarity of those hydrogen bonds that allows this cohesion between water molecules and adhesion with other polar molecules and ions. And so because last lecture Cameron asked me if we would talk about some invertebrates too, I added this extra little bit to today's lecture um, to talk about an insect so that we're not discounting all those other animals out there, even though, as I said, my, my knowledge is mostly based on vertebrate animals. But I attached a, a little Nature News um, sort of popular science article to go with this, and there's a link, uh, the two uh, links down there for the photograph, and then the, the Nature News article are there. But it, it's a fun little article to read. It's a, um, a biology teacher who wrote it as she was sitting by a pond one day in the summer and watching the water surface, and she saw that the surface of the water was really still and clear, like glass, and that the surface was only broken by a water, some minnows that would come up, but also a water strider that skimmed over the surface and made these sort of tiny dimples where its feet touched the water. And so you can really see that in this image. Um, and so she says that as a biology teacher, she loves thinking about water striders because um, whenever the, you know, the topic of water comes up as vital to life on Earth, like what, what we've been talking about, it's... Um, you know, we always talk about these amazing properties of water, and one of those properties is the, the stickiness of those water molecules. So water molecules like to stick to each other and to other, to other water molecules, and then excluding some other ones like air molecules, for example. And so when you have an, an air-water interface, the water molecules form something that's sort of like a skin. They stick to each other really well. Um, I mean, it's not a skin, but it's just, it sort of operates almost that way. And so um, and that's because of the surface tension. And so scientifically, again, it's not a skin, but it kind of looks like one um, because it makes a, a fairly strong surface. So for some animals, it's easier for them, uh, you know, usually it's easier to move under the water where the, are, where the molecules are not so sticky with each other versus to get through that sort of skin on the surface. So it's more difficult to break through that surface tension than to move around in the water beneath that for some animals, right? But then there's the water strider. Um, so again, water has this high surface tension, and so some organisms like water striders, they can actually take advantage of that and they walk on the surface instead of breaking through. And so um, there's quite a few species of, of water strider found in North America, and they are insects, so they have, of course, three pairs of legs, right? They have six legs. The front pair of legs are much shorter. You can see that in the image here. The front pair of legs is much shorter, 
than the back two sets. And those front legs, those are used for catching prey. So they're they're not used in the as much in the um, walking across the water surface. The, sh the short front legs are used to catch their prey, which is mostly aquatic insect larvae, like um, mosquitoes and dragonflies, for example. But then the, the back two sets of legs are mostly what's used to walk on the water, and they're specifically designed for this. So they're attached to the thorax in a bit of a different way. You can see that here, the way that they're attached in the mid middle there and then pointing sort of outwards opposite each other. Um, and this is a, a design, a morphology, that's optimal for water striding, but it doesn't work very well on land. So these are animals that are showing an adap adaptation to this uh, way of locomoting. So not all insects can walk on water. Water striders do it because they, in part, have very, excuse me, fine hairs on the undersides of these legs that trap air and repel water. So they're super hydrophobic. So that allows them to do this. And then um, the article also notes a video on the American Association for the Advancement of Science website that you can uh, check out as well. But what the researchers found is that by um, vigorously rowing along the surface, striders create swirls that help propel them forward, all without rupturing the water surface. So that's what the quote is in the article. And so um, it's interesting. They're also um, incredibly fast. They can move at the speed of 100 body lengths per second. So that's like, a, um, she quotes, a six foot tall person running at 400 miles per hour, which is amazing. Okay. Um, she also makes a little funny thing on the side that she recommends against trying to pick up water striders. She hasn't picked them up, but her kids have. And apparently, they have a very painful bite, which would maybe go with their ability to be good predators of uh, mosquito and dragonfly larva. Okay. Okay. A little bit more about water. So water occurs in six forms in the biosphere. So it's as vapor, as a gas. Um, fresh surface water, so like in streams and lakes. Um, groundwater, um, snow and ice, of course, salt water in the oceans, and then the body water of organisms is another source of water. And then, of course, there's the water cycle. And you've, again, probably learned about this quite a few times. So this is the movement of water between the Earth and the atmosphere by the precipitation and by evaporation. So precipitation falling down and evaporation going back up. Um, and so precipitation is the driving force of that water cycle. And so, you know, about 71% of the Earth's surface is water, which is a lot, right, more than half, but only a small amount of it is actually available to life as fresh water. And so the biosphere really depends on this continual cycle of renewal and replenishment of fresh water um, to keep things going. Okay, we'll talk a little bit about nutrients, so um, elemental nutrients. So certain elements are essential for growth and reproduction of all organisms. And we have two scales here for two, so macronutrients. These are the things that we need um, in large quantities like oxygen, <laughs> hydrogen, nitrogen, carbon, calcium, potassium, and then micronutrients, which are things we need in smaller quantities. Okay, so again, backing up. So for macronutrients, um, right, this is like oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, carbon, calcium, and potassium. So those would be macronutrients. Micronutrients, the things we need in smaller quantities. So this could be like copper and zinc, iodine, and iron, right, is another one. So those are micronutrients. So copper, zinc, iodine, and iron. Now, sources of nutrients for terrestrial life um, come from weathering of mineral soils, um, decomposition of organic matter, uh, nitrogen fixation, and the atmospheric gases, and then, you know, ocean salt from ocean spray was also a way of doing that. Um, and then sources of nutrients for aquatic organisms, aquatic life, this is inputs from the surrounding land, like, you know, drainage runoff and organic matter and sediment and precipitation. There's actually um, an article published, you, some of you may know John Gunn, uh, the Canada Research Chair in Stressed Aquatic Ecosystems, who's at the Living with Lakes Center. And some uh, members of his research team, I think it's maybe a year or two ago now, published a really neat paper, um, and I, maybe I should try to find it for you guys, but it's about this connection between the terrestrial and the aquatic systems and all these energy inputs and transfers, and it's really quite, um, quite a spectacular set of research. Okay, so um, maintenance of uh, inorganic nutrients involves recycling nutrients between the abiotic environment and the organisms themselves. So we have this sort of um, recycling 
um, process that's happening of nutrients. Okay. And the last thing I want to talk about a little bit was soil. Um, we're not going to talk about this too much at all, actually, because uh, you have learned about this before as well. But it's, we need to mention it, right? So soil is an essential resource. It's the foundation of terrestrial communities, right? Um, so directly or indirectly, all living organisms depend on soil. So again, you should have learned uh, quite a bit about soil, probably I think would have been in Principles of Ecology. Um, so there's you know, an integral role of soils and ecosystems. Um, and we'll just recap some uh, key points here. So it's actually sort of difficult to define what soil is. Um, so some, sometimes it's defined as a natural product formed from weathered rock by the action of climate and living organisms. And so it's a, a system consisting of mineral and gases and aqueous components um, that supports terrestrial life. So those are two, two sort of parts to a definition of, of soils. Um, so this, it's, it's important because it's a site for nutrient storage and delivery then, um, also nutrient transformation, also water storage, um, waste deposition and waste processing. It's also in terms of broader ecological concepts, you know, it's important for burrowing and nesting for a lot of organisms. It's an important place um, to escape a refuge for lots of organisms as well. And soil formation um, is related to a, a variation in like topography, things we've talked about already, and climate and vegetation. So it's uh, composed of both inorganic constituents and organic products. Um, and we typically characterize the components into five layers and they're called soil horizons. Right? So they're formed by these processes of deposition and leaching and weathering. And so we have this figure that uh, shows these soil horizons, you know, the bedrock, um, and as you move up to the surface where you get to topsoil and the humus layer on the surface. Again, I, I think you've probably learned about this stuff before. Um, so I wanted to bring it back again because in later lectures we're going to talk a little bit about um, how soil might impact some organisms. Um, we also, we distinguish soil based on physical and chemical properties. So things like the color, the texture, the depth, the moisture holding capacity, like the water potential in soils. And in a future lecture, um, one of the things I'm going to talk about is how soil properties have an impact on what hatchling turtles do when they're in the nest in the soil. And there's differences in how water behaves in those soils based on if it's a sandy soil or more of a clayey soil or a soil that has more organic constituents, the way water moves through those substrates differs because of the water potential of those different soil characteristics. And then you think about the animals that are there. So if you have a turtle in a nest in a sandy soil where water moves through really quickly, the water, or if it's wintertime, the ice becomes available to those hatchlings that are overwintering in that nest versus if it's a clayey soil. If you think about clay, think about if you have a cat and you have a litter box, which is basically filled with clay, when the cat pees, right, it bounds up, the clay holds onto the water and clumps it up. It's a clumping kitty litter. So it's a similar idea in clay that's in the ground, it's gonna hold onto water and that water then is less available to move to uh, intercept any animals that might be in that um, substrate. Okay, so just to, Quick summary of what we talked about today. We talked about climate on or three scales. We talked about global climate. We talked about regional climates and we talked about microclimate and all the, the interactions of, of weather over time and solar radiation, how it impacts the surface, um, the effects of ocean currents and the distribution of heat across the globe because of those um, ocean currents and they're impacted by Coriolis force um, and, and those aspects. We talked also about uh, abiotic aspects of the environment, just very uh, little, just a little bit. So we talked about light, we talked about temperature, talked about water and it's really amazing special properties. And we talked a little tiny bit about nutrients and then we talked very little about soils. So that's everything I wanted to talk about today, um, but I will now uh, stop sharing my screen and we can go to the chat if people want to talk about other things. If anybody has any questions, 
You can also, I mean, I don't know if you guys want to just try asking a question by unmuting yourselves and talking, or if you would rather use the chat. I don't see any questions. And I don't see anybody who's got, there's also, you can raise your hand if you want to uh, get access uh, like maybe turn on your camera and open your mic and ask a question. But if not, I guess we'll call it done. I'll just wait a couple of minutes. If people want to depart, they can go ahead. It's a bit of a short lecture, um, but if anybody has any questions, I'll hang out for a little bit.